And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our leader and uh, chairman, uh, Felix Boschlein uh, from Zurich, Switzerland. Thank you very much, um, Anand. I'm uh, finally sharing my screen once again. Um, and uh, I would like to end uh, this session with emergency. And I would start off with a, a, another case um, a vignette here. Now consider a 62 year old female patient who had been found by her husband in a state of disorientation and somnolence. He does call the emergency, of course, he's very worried. And uh, the team um, or, um, um, gets the, the history from, from the husband of the patient. Uh, so the patient had been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis three years ago. And among other uh, um, treatment, she is under long-term on-off steroid medication with prednisolone. According to the husband, the current dosage had been 10 milligram, but he's not really sure about the timing of the latest uh, tapering. Um, the emergent team applies uh, oxygen and uh, gets her vital signs, which show a low blood pressure of 90 to 60 millimeter uh, mercury, pulse of uh, 98 per minute, oxygen uh, saturation with oxygen applied of 95%. Her temperature is 38.5 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, and the patient reacts when spoken to. Now, um, here comes the question to you. What would you consider as an appropriate next step. Uh, one, uh, A is non-emergency glucocorticoid replacement as this would require more specific information. You're, so you leave it as it is. You admit the patient to a hospital primarily to measure baseline cortisol to get more information about the function of her HBA axis or option C, you assume an adrenal crisis and you manage that accordingly. So if we can have the poll. Here we go. Very good. The most popular answer is, uh, is C with 85%. You do assume an adrenal crisis you manage accordingly. And some of you would like to get more information and with a baseline cortisol level. Here we go. Thank you. So we uh, move on and uh, come to the um, guideline recommendations. So that's recommendation 3.2. We should suggest that patients with current or recent glucocorticoid use who did not undergo biochemical testing, so you don't have much uh, uh, information on this particular patient, um, which present with hemodynamic instability, vomiting, or diarrhea, the diagnosis of adrenal crisis should be considered irrespectively of the glucocorticoid type, the mode of administration, and dose. Patients with suspected adrenal crisis should be treated with parental glucocorticoids and fluid resuscitation. This is good clinical practice. There is not good uh, evidence, but you um, you treat them as if they had adrenal crisis. We're coming back to the uh, case vignette. This uh, is also what happened under the clinical suspicion of a potential infection-driven adrenal crisis. The team applies. 250 milligrams of hydrocortisone and initiate fluid administration. And the patient is after that admitted to the hospital. All right, now the adrenal crisis in patients with uh, glucocorticoid uh, use adrenal insufficiency is not really that much different of also a, uh, of a primary adrenal insufficiency. So in the case of a suspected adrenal crisis, you provide steroids, fluid administration, and usually you will um, provide this patient, send this patient uh, into a hospital. The same holds true in a situation with prolonged vomiting, diarrhea, without hemodynamic instability, because at that, at that point you are um, uh, worried about uh, the uh, insufficient absorption of glucocorticoid that uh, might reduce by these gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, and you do consider parental glucocorticoids to prevent an adrenal crisis. And uh, uh, just to say this again, this is not really different in any form of suspected adrenal insufficiency. Um, which comes uh, to the uh, recommendations 3.1. We do recommend that patients, again, with current or recent glucocorticoid use who has, have not undergone uh, biochemical testing to rule out glucocorticoid induced adrenal insufficiency. Again, you don't have all the information that you would like to have. 
those should receive stress dose coverage when they are exposed to stress. Again, uh, um, good clinical practice as the evident grade. And again, this is uh, very much similar to the situation of primary adrenal sufficiency. You can grade the, the stress into moderate or major stre stress or minor stress. And uh, there are some peculiarities uh, for patients under glucocorticoid treatment. Um, and this is also taken into consideration here uh, in this uh, table of the guideline. So for example, if you have patients under minor stress, which are under already quite high uh, um, treatment of uh, with glucocorticoids due to their um, underlying disorder, in those cases, not necessarily a further increase of glucocorticoid is uh, to be done. And the same with moderate and major stress with very high doses of glucocorticoids, which might be present in those patients Again, in uh, here, again, you might consider not doubling or tripling the dose as you would do otherwise. Okay, which brings me already to the final uh, point, future research. So we were all in a way unpleasantly surprised how low the evidence of uh, this condition is that affects up to 1% of the world population, really a tremendously large uh, population of patients. So evidence for the majority of the above recommendations regarding glucocorticoid-induced adrenal sufficiency is low or very low. This is what uh, had been uh, said already in the beginning. So how can we improve the situation? We would like to see to the, be defined the true risk of clinical adrenal crisis and adrenal insufficiency in this population of patients. We would like to have defined risk factors that contribute to the development and susceptibility of adrenal insufficiency. The understanding of glucocorticoid withdrawal is an important issue because this is yet ill described and also the, um, the um, mechanisms of this uh, situation are not well understood. Harmonization of cortisol assays and establish of a cutoff values using mass spectrometry might be an issue, but I would also like to point out again that uh, clinical um, uh, uh, evidence uh, and um, um, evaluation of your patient is uh, at least as important as uh, clinical cutoffs. Uh, and finally, to identify glucocorticoids that retain their immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory properties, but having less effect of HBA axis suppression, that of course would be very nice to decrease the likelihood of glucocorticoid use of insufficiency to start with. Now, with this very final slide, I would like to uh, uh, give the round to the group of individuals who have contributed to this guideline. It has been a a pleasure to do so. And you find here on the QR code, so please use your uh, um, mobile phones to scan in the guidelines, both in the Euro uh, European Journal of Endocrinology and the JCM, and also the mentioned patient information. So please use that and spread the word. And with that, I stop my screen sharing and hand over to was Martin Fasnacht for guiding the sessions on uh, uh, question and answers. Martin, please. Thanks a lot, Felix. Thanks a lot, all of you, for your nice presentations. And now it's time for the audience. We are really a lot of people, and it's now time to send in your patients. We have already first patient, first questions. I will try to sort them a little bit, and we probably will start more or less chronologically in the within the talk. And the first question goes to Olaf. You 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 raised this topic, but again, maybe could you give us an idea how often that topical steroids and or nasal spray cause adrenal insufficiency? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think it's important to, to consider that the probability is not zero. So quite likely it's a few percent. Um, so the meta analysis shows it's probably three, four percent of the patients, but there are several issues here. So one of the issues is what Anand already said. Very often these patients take multiple forms of uh, glucocorticoids. Um, and the other point he showed is nice slide that, that in many patients there is some suppression. And, and I think it's a question of degree, um, but, but the main point is please consider it also if patients only take what we call only 
topical or nasal uh, spray. Okay, thanks a lot. Then there is a, a whole bunch of questions regarding glucocorticoid withdrawal syndrome. First question, Irina, do you see hypoglycemia in these patients? Or is this something which is then indicative of an adrenal insufficiency? Yeah, hypoglycemia can be seen mostly in the scenarios where a patient has um, insulin-dependent diabetes, which needs more insulin because of the higher prednisone dose. And then when prednisone decreases, there's just too much insulin for that situation. So hypoglycemia requires usually more than one factor and usually some sort of treatment with insulin therapy. Otherwise, by itself, it's not very common symptom, but possible. Next question is, in a patient on Pretni 5 milligram long-term, can we stop suddenly? I think you, you mentioned this, but or as the, the question continues, or taper to 2.5 milligram and then to the other day, 2.5 milligram. Could you maybe just give a little yeah. bit of personal experience once more? Yeah, so... so... Just to remind the audience, the guidelines recommend two different approaches. One of them just to slowly taper until zero, but monitor clinical symptoms. So of course, in this case, we can go from five to 2.5, monitor, and if everything goes well, stop it. Uh, the second way is uh, to test for cortisol. And if you do have cortisol, and cortisol is above 10 microns per deciliter, above 300 animals per liter, we think we have enough evidence to say it's safe to stop suddenly. But we can do whatever we want. <laughs> so if cortisol is 11 and you want to taper to 2.5 because you're concerned stopping suddenly, I don't think there is anything wrong about it. Okay. Well, then there are two questions which probably come from countries where obviously prednisone is only available in five milligrams and not in smaller dosage. And the question is, how you deal with this situation? What is your recommendation here? Get a good pill cutter. <laughs> well, it's, it's difficult to cut in four parts. So in this case, it's, I would deal with 2.5 milligram increments. I, I do think there is um, uh, a proportion of patients who would not do well with a 2.5 milligram decline. Um, so I would be inventive in those cases. But it is possible to cut a pill in four. There is also probably a solution for kids, which could be looked at. I, I maybe just to, to add, there might be countries where there is not the lower dosage of prednisolone, but still hydrocortisone might be available. And there, the cutting to lower you know, um, um, portions might be at least an, uh, still an option. Right. Certainly, everybody, other everybody else from the speaker can certainly jump in. I try to sort this a little bit, but certainly everybody is um, at something as well. The next question is: How long after stopping prednisolone do you check cortisol? If you check it, some say twenty-four and some say forty-eight hours. Could you just again? Yeah. So my approach is twenty-four hours. Um, for majority of people, prednisone would not impact HPA axis if you would measure uh, it 24 hours after. I suppose there are some people where it would last longer, but uh, as of now, I have not seen that in my clinical practice. So 24 hours is enough, especially when, when you are considering that, well, I guess there is another way to look at it. So what if a person with adrenal insufficiency does not take prednisone for one extra day? How dangerous is it? If you are concerned, don't wait 48 hours. <laughs> so if you're not concerned, you can wait 48 hours. I think it depends on your patient and what symptoms are being reported. Ruby, you want to? Yeah, yeah, just real quick. So I think, I mean, the other question is always, and, and we, we haven't talked much about this, is the cross-reactivity with essays, right? Which is with partners and parents are probably one of the more more burning issues, right? But I mean, that should be should be largely gone, or it should be that low that, um, that you know, you can probably still live with a 5, 10, maybe minimally higher 
threshold. But it also highlights that, um, you know, it's it's it, it depends on what essay and what the cross reactivity is. Right. And I think that's one of the main future things If we were able to measure everything by mass spectrometry, then we would have a direct value and and, and it would be it would be OK. Right. But I, I just wanted to add that in addition to the um, suppression of the HPA axis. OK, then I think we move now to Arland. Arland, several questions for you as well. Intermittent versus continuous steroid use, what is the difference? What is the difference between intermittent and continuous steroid use on the risk of adrenal insufficiency? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's hard to give a general answer because it's not just the frequency, it has to do with the dose, the duration of exposure. So for example, taking a, a daily superphysiologic dose of an oral glucocorticoid, like the dexamethasone in Irina's cases for days at a time, months at a time, or the prednisone, high dose prednisone in my case, the probability just keeps increasing by week, by week, by week, such that once you eat, hit three to four weeks, it's very likely that that super physiologic continuous dose is going to impair the HP axis to some degree. And every duration beyond that is going to increase that. Intermittent glucocorticoids, for example, patients getting chemotherapy, receiving pulses of dexamethasone for uh, anti uh, uh reasons, intraarticular injections, they're the... The factors that play a role are what is the formulation? So something like dexamethasone, long-acting, uh, intraarticular triamcinolone, a very potent, long-acting glucocorticoid, uh, and what's the height of the pulse, the dose. So what I would say, I think Olaf said it well, is there's a non-zero chance that any of these things can cause adrenal insufficiency, and you have to use your clinical judgment to integrate the dose, the magnitude of effect, the duration, the frequency of exposure, and the totality that gives you some risk estimate. But it's always possible that glucocorticoids can induce adrenal insufficiency. Okay, thanks. So then some question regarding the testing. So do the limits of morning cortisol testing applies only to, or also to non-iotogenic adrenal insufficiency? So use, are you using this morning cortisol test and your values also for other situations? This is a very good question. Actually, I think all the panelists should comment on this. So I think if I'm interpreting that right, what you're saying is, yeah, is the, the, the guideposts, remember, these are not cutoffs, these are guidelines of 10 or 300, suggesting an appropriate cortisol for glucocorticoid-induced adrenal insufficiency, for primary adrenal insufficiency, for just a general check of the HP axis, I think as a general guideline, yes. And this is with a few caveats. Uh, the caveat being you're using relatively uh, modern and reliable cortisol assays. Uh, we use immunoassays, Elixir, Roche Elixis 2, very accurate immunoassays, and also mass spec. A cortisol value of approximately 10 micrograms per deciliter, 300 to me, means there's sufficient ACTH to produce sufficient cortisol from uh, a pretty ample zona fasciculata to ward off the probability of an adrenal crisis very highly. So it's not, it doesn't mean it's normal, but it means that it's either normal or very close to normal. And I think that applies to a general assessment of the HP axis, not just to iatrogenic or glucocorticoid induced adrenal insufficiency. But, but others can co comment on that. Anybody else who won't comment here? I, I would agree in that regard that, you know, the, the reason for adrenal insufficiency as you know, a rule of thumb, I would also uh, say that this doesn't make lots of a difference. Obviously, context is important. If you have a patient, you know, on, in septic uh, septic conditions, then uh, baseline cortisol is a different ballpark than a patient, uh, you know, otherwise uh, being healthy and so on. Yeah, Irina, you sorry. Well, I completely agree. But just to, to add uh, to what Anand and Felix said, we, we do have data on endogenous adrenal Cushing's recovery that shows that 10 microns per deciliter in the morning is a great cutoff to use. And I'm just sharing um, unpublished data from 1,500 people who did have kisentropin stimulation test and reached a peak of 18 and above. 
arguable that, that you know possibly what is normal or not. But what I'm trying to get to is that only one percent of people with cortisol of ten and above did not reach the peak of eighteen after cisentropin in this unpublished but very large database. Of Hopefully soon will be published. So um, it's for cassandropin stimulation test lovers, because I know how many people love this test. Yeah, actually, I will just add to that in one way that may be helpful. So in glucocorticoid-induced adrenal insufficiency, we're thinking about the rise of cortisol from negligible up. And what we are saying in this guideline is once it gets to approximately 10 or 300, and the ACTH may be super physiologic at that time, you can be rest assured that if you were to stop the system would continue its path to full recovery had that not represented full recovery. What this person is asking, the reason I think it's a good question is, what about the converse? What about somebody who's developing primary adrenal insufficiency and you're catching them at this moment where they haven't developed a full crisis, the cortisol is on the way down, it's 10, but the ACTH might be 500, 600, and they're complaining of symptoms. If you adjudicate the system there, the next step is, you know, maybe they develop an adrenal crisis. Does that happen? Yes, I've diagnosed many people with Addison's disease at that moment. So you do have to use your clinical judgment. As Irina said, probably 99.9% .9 of the time, this value and your assessment will be accurate without additional testing. But should you suspect other features of primary adrenal insufficiency, the opposite, you know, weight loss, salt cravings, hyperpigmentation, you have to still function as a clinical doctor who has an intuition uh, that doesn't dismiss everything based on a number. So it is important to note that those guideposts of 10 and 300 were meant to make your lives easier. They were meant to make non-endocrinologists' lives easier so that for the vast majority of these cases, they don't have to refer it for a dynamic test that requires a room and resources. But it doesn't mean that every single case can be adjudicated through that. Okay, I have two more questions regarding testing and maybe Toby wants to jump in here. So one is regarding... Can adrenal insufficiency be assessed with salivary cortisol? And the second is, would it be useful to measure afternoon 4 p.m. cortisol? Any comments on this from you or Toby or from someone else? Well, I mean, certainly others others can give their opinion. I mean, none of these tests, I would say, is is as established as um, the morning cortisol or cosetropin stim test, right? I mean, I think there is good evidence that at some point salivary cortisol can probably be used, right? So that is something where um, which 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 might well be well be um, of 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 benefit um, with regards to the afternoon measurements. Um, I mean, in general, it's like when I think about the HPA axis, I measure cortisol in the morning when I want to look for insufficiency. I measure it at midnight when I look for too much cortisol, right? Because it's about the um, the circadian rhythm. So that's why I would um, always go for the morning cortisol. But that's just my opinion. I'm sure somebody else can chime in and say something about this. I just have another thing to add. If afternoon cortisol is 10 and above, yes, you can use it. If it's below that, you can't. And the probability that's above 10 is higher in the morning than in the afternoon. Um, so from a practical perspective and a testing perspective, it makes more sense to test in the morning. Okay. Then a specific question to Felix with the um, crisis situation. Have you ever encountered significant psychiatric symptoms in a patient after administering steroids during a treatment of an adrenal crisis and how to deal with this situation? Uh, I don't recall that I have come into this situation. Theoretically, that's a possibility. However, I think, you know, it's much more likely in this, in a situation as, you know, in the case vignette, that um, omitting uh, steroid um, administration at a high dose is uh, the, you know, it's, it's probably harming the patient more than the possibility of side effects of glucocorticoids also with hyperglycemia uh, and, and others. So in that regard, I think uh, to be sure not to miss the probably rare event of an adrenal crisis is more important than um, the, the theoretical possibility of, of overtreatment. Okay, then 
a more general question, which I believe is not so easy and maybe everybody, but maybe our methodologist Olaf wants to here give the first response is, is regarding stopping steroids in natural insufficiency in elderly and young patients. The, problem, the question is probably, is there a difference in dealing with elderly and young patients? Is there ev evidence on this? Or do you have, a, as a group, different experience in depending on the age? So with regard to the evidence, I think the answer is, is quite simple. We don't have evidence um, that it's very different in, in terms of um, clinical clinical outcomes. So, so there, there we don't know. And I think I said earlier, um, it's, it's a balance between taking some risks, um, taking into account clinical situation, taking into account the ACTH test, the duration of, um, of response. But I don't know, and maybe Irina knows better that the adrenal reserve might be slightly higher in people who are younger, which um, might make sense from a biological point of view. Anybody has a solution or a reasonable answer on this? I just wanted to add is that it's difficult to answer this question because what's old and what's young? You know, what is it? So, um, so and and I think we all change our adrenal, our adrenals age continuously, right? There is no particular cut of that at this age, you approach it differently. And um, ultimately adrenal insufficiency manifests the same way, whether you are young or old, meaning you, we need to replace cortisol in these cases. Otherwise, people get in trouble and die. And I might want to add just a general uh, point that um, I guess overall we're talking about, I, I, there is a good likelihood that we are talking about elderly patients who are uh, have a glucocorticoid dependent uh, disease and with that more com comorbidities. And I think we should not forget, which have now all these patients in common, that they have a disease which is treated rightly or not so with glucocorticoids. And this, you know, by definition can cause uh, symptoms on problems which make things sometimes more complicated. This is not exactly to the point of the question, but just to mention this, that, you know, always also in the list that uh, Irina showed, you know, glucocorticoid withdrawal, adrenal sufficiency, and recurrence uh, uh, of the uh, underlying disease is uh, among the problems uh, to worry about. Okay, time is more or less over. Maybe one last question. We have... I could not cover all questions, but one last question is more general about the steroids, if I understood it correctly. Which is better, morning or morning and evening steroid to avoid adrenal fatigue if we plan for a one month course? So how, how likely would it that you get in a one month course and if it's different morning or morning and evening steroids? Maybe Felix, do you want to take this last question? If I understood correctly, the likelihood of adrenal insufficiency in a patient taking steroids in the morning or in the morning and in the evening, well, then I guess the likelihood is higher in the morning and in the evening, both for dosage and, you know, versus HPA axis uh, circadian rhythm, that I guess the likelihood would be higher to develop adrenal insufficiency. Okay. Then I think we are more or less done, at least time-wise. I would just like to share the last slide now. I think it's now not, not anymore on this full screen, but anyway, I think I would like to thank you. Maybe I stop this, this is not perfect. So I would like to thank again, these five distinct speakers, all the other guideline panel members who worked in the background to develop these guidelines, I'm sure and I hope that also with this webinar, we spread the word or you spread the word and this is then helpful for many patients. Therefore, thank to your entire group. And I certainly would like to thank all the audience um, for participating for different questions. And I wish you all a good day, evening, wherever you are. And thanks again to all of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.